We're very thankful. We have our own expert who's going to answer your questions about COP. And that is Bob McDonald, the host of Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio, up in Victoria and ready to go today. I know a lot about you, Bob, from our years together, but <laughs> I was stunned with something I learned while Johanna was reporting. When did you first start talking about climate change? <laughs> Before you were born, Heather. Uh, <laughs> 1977 wish. was my first documentary at CBC, uh, CBC Radio's Ideas, and it was about climate change. 1977. That's I've been incredible. reporting on it ever since. And, and uh, know so yeah. much about it. And so as I've been talking, uh, getting set to talk to you, here's the headline that just moved in, and then I will get to the questions. The world is on track for 2.4 degrees Celsius of warming this century based on the latest climate pledges, Bob, from 2030. That's the climate action tracker. That's not what they're trying to do over there in Glasgow, is it? That's not going to get the world to where it needs to be, is it? It's a little over where we would uh, where we would like to be, um, and what they're worried about, what the scientists are worried about, are called tipping points, and that's where you you reach a point you can push nature so far and it'll take it, and but then it gets to a point where nature responds, and then there's a feedback loop that happens, and then things accelerate from there. Uh, that's what they're trying to avoid is the tipping points. We haven't reached them yet, but that two degree is pretty close to it. Okay, viewer questions. A lot of them, excellent questions. I'm going to jump in with Wendy and Ken Morris, wondering, Bob, what percentage of climate change can be attributed to humankind compared to natural causes? Yeah, this is a question that comes up a lot because uh, people argue, well, the earth has been warm and cold in the past. In fact, back in 77, when I was first starting, there was a debate about whether or not the earth was going to get warmer or colder because the earth does go through natural ice ages. We've had five ice ages and between each of the ice ages is a warm period that lasts about 10,000 years. Well, it's been 12,000 years since the last ice age. So some geologists were saying, hey, we should be getting colder if we follow the natural trend. But then other groups were saying, the climatologists were saying, no, there are these new greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere. That's going to overpower that and cause it to get warmer. Well, we know who won that debate. So the, the thing is that Volcanoes put out lots of carbon dioxide. The Earth itself puts out lots of carbon dioxide. But that effect has always been there. That's the background. What we're doing is adding on top of that. We're putting our foot on the accelerator and we're accelerating the rate of change. It's the rate of change that we're, we're responsible for. The changes in the past would take millennia to happen. We're now doing things in centuries and decades. And that's the issue. Uh, so our contribution uh, is on top of nature it might be a small percentage but it's enough to push it up over that edge and that's the issue wendy and ken thank you very much graham nichols has a question too wondering and johanna bob as you heard just reporting on how the disappointment in glasgow is there's still a lot of talk about the reliance on fossil fuels where is all of the reliable energy going to come from to replace fossil fuels which as graham notes continue to dominate the global primary energy supply bob it's going to come from everywhere. We're going to get away from this system where we have large generating stations that feed large areas, uh, whether they're coal-fired, oil-fired, nuclear, whatever. And we're going to have energy come from everywhere, including your house. Uh, it's going to come from the sun. It's going to come from the wind. It's going to come from tides. It's going to come from geothermal. And the difficulty with that is that we've been spoiled with oil because it's very energy dense. There's a huge amount of energy. Uh, there's a thousand times more energy in gasoline than there is in, say, solar energy. Because solar energy, there's lots of it, but it's spread out over large areas, so you have to gather it up to, to use it. There's also the possibility, I'm not saying we need to get entirely off oil, because there are other ways to get energy out of oil besides just burning it. Uh, what we've been doing for the last 150 years is digging fossil fuels out of the ground and lighting a match, and it goes boom but not all of it burns, and it's the leftovers that are uh, getting the uh, atmosphere to warm up. When we burn gasoline or burn fossil fuels, what we're really burning is hydrogen. That's why it's a hydrocarbon. So the hydrogen comes off and combines with oxygen and burns, but the carbon that's left behind is polluting. Well, what if we just took the hydrogen out, which is what the oil industry is now looking at? Let's just make hydrogen. There's even a company in Saskatchewan that's figured out a way to get hydrogen out of the ground without removing the oil. 
So huh. this is the kind of thing that we can do. We can move to hydrogen. Uh, you're going to have solar panels on your roof. You're going to have uh, the, another interesting thing about solar energy. We, we tend to think of large solar farms that take up a big area, but there are new materials that are, are very, very thin, thin film, and some of them are actually transparent. So you could have solar windows. Think about that. Think about all the glass area in the big uh, downtown buildings. Solar, solar paint. Huh. So it'll be incorporated into the ar architecture of the building. So energy is going to be generated everywhere. Even your own clothing. Uh, there are fibers they can put in that will generate electricity and charge a device in your pocket. So this is the future. It's going to come from everywhere rather than uh, just from large centralized stations. It's so interesting. We, we this week, Carolyn Dunn took us to Canada's largest solar farm, which is in, yeah, in Alberta. Alberta. We were there in Vulcan. So that's interesting. When you mention hydrogen, it ties in with a couple of other questions, uh, Gigi and um, Abbas. Gigi's question, mm -hmm. can Canada produce green hydrogen? I think you've already answered that one, Bob. But in, mm. in, in, in concert with that, are we utilizing the full capacity of our hydroelectric power, given how much water and how many rivers we have here? Right. Well, green hydrogen is different from the hydrogen that we're, uh, we're making today. Uh, when you make hydrogen from fossil fuels, there still are emissions from that. There are carbon emissions from that because they get it from natural gas. Now, if we included carbon sequestration along with that, then that's called blue hydrogen. And uh, that's where you take the carbon and you stuff it underground. Green hydrogen is where you use clean alternatives, whether it's hydro or wind or solar, and you use that to break down water which is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O, and that's how you get hydrogen that way. We have the capacity to do that. Uh, here in British Columbia, where I live, uh, it's all hydro here, and so we can make hydrogen. And in fact, I saw my first hydrogen-powered car on the road uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Really? Toyota makes the Toyota Mira, which is a, a hydrogen car that's now available, and they're going to put out some new ones. And here on the West Coast, they're experimenting with hydrogen fueling stations, and they're doing the same thing in California. Now, hydrogen and batteries have always been competing, competing with each other, and batteries took off because there's so much research, mainly because of Tesla. So batteries are, at the moment, dominating. But you watch. Hydrogen's going to come back. A question, since you mentioned carbon sequestration, uh, Harold had a question. What are the uses for recaptured CO2? Carbon dioxide is used a lot. Uh, it's used in fire extinguishers, CO2 fire extinguishers. It's used in inflatable rafts, uh, rafts that inflate themselves, and including life vests. You know when you're on a plane and they, they have that yellow thing put over your head, pull the, the, the tabs? Yes. Well, there are little mm -hmm. CO2 cartridges in there that will inflate life vests for that. Uh, it's used in the beverage industry. It's used in uh, industry where they don't want oxygen nearby if they want to make sure that uh, something that's very hot doesn't burst into flame. And and here's a new one, Heather. Um, there's, I know one of the, uh, you sent me the questions ahead of time. One of the other people is asking about concrete. Yes. Uh, making, making cement is one of the biggest uh, polluters of, of greenhouse gases. And uh, they're aware of that. And there's a new chemistry that they're coming up with to actually incorporate carbon dioxide into the cement itself. Mm -hmm. And this, this is amazing. They can cut their emissions, they think, by almost 70% by incorporating carbon dioxide into the chemistry. So imagine that. We would be sequestering chemistry in our buildings in addition uh -huh. to putting it underground. That's a, just a fabulous idea. So uh, we still have a long way to go. We're producing far more than we're sequestering, but it can be done. And also here in Canada, we have the largest carbon sequestration plant in North America called Boundary Dam, where they're, they're demonstrating how that can be done. That was Ed Fox's question, so thank you, Ed, for that. You know, Ken, just before I let you go, because we're going to go to Ottawa, uh, I mentioned Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole is going to be holding a media briefing. I don't see him yet, Bob, so one more quick question. I was struck by, obviously, the world is covering what's co happening at COP26, and in some of the British media, they were talking about people following, but still people not willing to make the changes in their own life and their own habits to lead to the reduction in, in, in temperature, the reduction in warming. What is the one thing that you tell people that we can all do to make for a greener future? 
Well, the one thing I, I do is say, look at uh, look at how much you drive. Can you walk? Uh, can you do other forms of transportation? And there's a lot that's happening at the municipal level to create 15-minute cities where you can get everything you need within 15 minutes. And COVID taught us that. A lot of people that had to stay at home during COVID were looking for local places to buy their groceries and things. And if we can redesign our towns and cities so that there's more accessible to us so we can use our feet, bicycles, and cut down on, on just our transportation, uh, that's that would go a long way. And do it incrementally. If you own a home, um, look into solar panels and see how much they, they cost. Their cost has come way, way down. If you're replacing your furnace, uh, go electric rather than natural gas. When was the last time you, you changed your windows and improved the insulation in your home? So we can incrementally step our way through this. It's not going to happen overnight, but if all of us just keep working at it as best we can, we'll make real change from the ground up. Since 1977, you've been talking about this, and I appreciate the latest conversation with us, as always. Bob McDonald, thanks. Hope we talk soon. Absolutely. Always a pleasure, Heather. Okay, thanks.